Hey, good evening, everyone, for those of you on the East Coast, at least, um, for those of you in other places, good afternoon, good morning, good, good late night, depending on where you are. Um, we're so glad that you're all joining us for this webinar um, hosted by the Selective Mutism Association this evening. Um, we'll give folks another minute or two to trickle in and then just jump right into things. We have a, a really information packed agenda um, and lots of wonderful speakers um, who are eager to, to share some of their knowledge and expertise with you all. Um, there was a, a question that already popped up into the, the Q&A, will there be handouts and slides? And the answer to that is yes, we will send out the slides um, after the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and use the Q&A function um, of Zoom. You can also put things into the chat, but um, if you have a question, Q&A is the best spot for that. Um, I am Dr. Rachel Merson. I'm currently the president of the Selective Mutism Association and have the pleasure and honor of moderating tonight's webinar. Um, I'm also a clinical psychologist at the Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders at Boston University. Um, I would love to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, we have four speakers today who really are, are experts um, in this field and who are going to be presenting on the assessment measures that they've developed, um, which are very focused on selective mutism specifically. So first we have Dr. Lindsay Bergman, who is the director of the Intensive Outpatient Program at the Wave Mind Clinic in Los Angeles. She's been the recipient of multiple federal grants for the study of selective mutism and conducted the first randomized controlled trial of behavioral therapy treatments for SM. She's authored dozens of peer reviewed research articles and chapters on SM as well as pediatric anxiety and OCD. We then have Dr. Angelica Gensthaler, who is not with us this evening, um, but has pre-recorded um, her part of the presentation for us to view um, because she is in Frankfurt, Germany, where it is the middle of the night. Um, but she is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and selective mutism researcher. She's currently working as a lecturer, supervisor, and um, involved in the training of child and adolescent psychotherapists at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, and has published over 15 papers on SM anxiety and related social emotional concerns. Then we have Dr. Stephen Kurtz, who specializes in assessing and treating child anxiety, as well as externalizing disorders such as ADHD and oppositionality. Dr. Kurtz is the original developer of um, parent-child interaction therapy for selective mutism, or PCITSM, an empirically supported therapy for SM used worldwide. And he created the Mighty Mouth Kids and Brave Buddies intensive SM treatment programs. He's a board certified specialist in behavioral and cognitive psychology, and he volunteers time in the leadership of numerous organizations, including the Selective Mutism Association. And last, but certainly not least, we have Dr. Elisa Shippon Blum. She is the president and director of the Selective Mutism Anxi Anxiety and Related Disorders Treatment Center, or the SMART Center in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. In her practice, she uses social communication anxiety treatment, an evidence-based treatment she developed from her years studying and researching SM. Um, Dr. E also created CommuniCamp, an intensive group treatment program for children with SM, social anxiety, and extreme shyness. She is the founder and director emeritus of the Selective Mutism Association and one of the directors of, of the Selective Mutism Research Institute. Um, in addition, she is a board certified physician and a clinical assistant professor of psychology and family medicine at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. So as you can see, this is an incredibly accomplished um, and experienced panel, and it really is our pleasure as the Selective Mutism Association to bring them to you this evening um, to discuss tools for gathering information, making diagnoses, and monitoring progress. 
Um, I would like to start with a quick shout out um, as this webinar was made possible. Um, thanks to the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation. Um, it's through their generosity that FMA has the funds to bring you programming like this. And I am um, going to say a few quick words about assessment, um, but really will breeze through those so I can turn um, the, the microphone, so to speak, over to our panelists. Um, oh, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Here's my introduction slide, and, and I already introduced everyone. But um, again, you can see our, our panelists and you know, a little bit about where they're from and uh, some of the work they've done. Um, so when we were putting together this assessment, we were thinking about, well, what is you know, kind of the rationale for it? Um, and we spent a lot of time as an organization talking about the most effective treatments for selective mutism and you know, working together to continue to grow the body of evidence um, to inform good treatment. Um, but before we can get to really good treatment, we need to start with good assessment. Um, we need to really understand not just the symptoms that a child is presenting with, but how those symptoms are manifesting and how that might be different in different contexts and, and situations. Um, and what are some of the related factors that are influencing a, a child's presentation? And it's only by starting with that really high quality assessment that we can come up with the most effective and um, accurate case conceptualization to guide the treatment plan that we are putting together for a particular child. And with that good assessment and that good treatment, we you know, hopefully will see improved clinical outcomes. So we're taking sort of a step backwards with this presentation and starting at the very beginning um, and thinking about you know, assessing um, and kind of what that means and, and how to do it in, in different ways. Part of the rationale um, for good assessment is not just informing our initial case conceptualization and treatment planning, but it's also thinking about how we can monitor progress as we're working with a child with selective mutism um, and using objective and, and quantitative data to inform the treatment that we're doing. So we know when we need to make course corrections and um, when we may proceed as we are. So another important piece of assessment um, that feeds into good treatment is helping us monitor where we are. And finally, when we think about good assessment tools, we're also thinking about their role in the research that we're doing. We need good assessments and good tools for monitoring progress in order to really increase the validity of the research findings that are then in informing our treatments. Um, and are leading to the you know, more desirable clinical outcomes that we want to see, the reductions of anxiety and the increases in speech and just the overall enhancement of functioning for the children and families with more working. Um, so for sort of all of these different reasons, the assessment piece is really critical um, in you know, thinking about how we're working with a, a child and family, how we're interpreting research and how we're um, using and, and developing future research studies. When we think about evidence-based assessment, there is a wealth of information and assessment tools out there for anxiety more broadly. And here are a few of those citations, um, which you know, may be relevant to many folks on this call um, or the, you know, in the audience because we know um, that other forms of anxiety are so highly comorbid with selective mutism. However, None of these measures um, that are sort of part of kind of the, the wealth of information about anxiety assessment are really selective mutism specific. Um, luckily, there are a few things that our panelists are going to talk about um, that really do get in there and focus specifically on SM symptoms. Um, so there's a very recent, um, just published a little over a year ago, year, um, research study that just reviewed what measures are folks even using um, in selective mutism treatment studies. For me, the most shocking finding of this study was that in this sort of huge review of all of the SM literature that's out there, all of the um, SM treatment studies, 
almost 40% of them didn't actually use any quantitative measures to inform their assessments or um, measure progress. So that's a lot of information that is kind of missing from the um, SM literature. Um, however, some of the studies that, are, that did include assessment measures um, included in um, the ones that we're going to be talking about tonight. And you know, in fact, the, the measures that were developed by our panelists are some of the ones that come up most commonly in the literature. Um, and you know, it, it, that's really in line with the, the mission that we have of sharing evidence-based inf information with, with our community and with you all. Um, so with that, I am going to turn things over to our panelists. And we are first going to invite uh, Dr. Lindsay Bergman to speak. She is the developer of the SMQ or the Selective Mutism Questionnaire, which was the very first SM specific um, assessment measure. So Dr. Bergman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, okay, let me share my screen here. And we can get started. Okay. So <clears throat> the Selective Mutism Questionnaire, or the SMQ, um, was developed uh, beginning in the uh, late 1990s, so a long time ago. Um, and the rationale for the development of it was that there were no uh, measures, standardized measures, to assess the primary symptoms of selective mutism. And what I mean by the primary symptoms uh, is the lack of speech. And having no standardized measure really hampered doing research and treatment. Uh, when in research studies at the time, what the investigators did was they would use measures that addressed some peripheral symptoms. So the CBC, CBCL, for instance, the Achenbach measures would, you know, have measure like withdrawal or other other measures that measured withdrawal, um, using the rationale that kids with selective mutism are often somewhat withdrawn. And while that is the case, that's certainly not the, the primary symptom of selective mutism. Um, or they would use social anxiety measures. And again, social, social anxiety is certainly relevant for selective mutism, but not to not actually measure speaking behaviors really seem to me very problematic. In treatment studies, often just subjective measures were used, having therapists rate how much better the child seems to be or how much more they seem to be talking. Um, so it was really a problem in comparing studies that use different non-standardized measures or were using measures that were, were really looking at non- um, central symptoms. It made it difficult to replicate studies and to evaluate treatment studies that were looking at outcomes that weren't weren't central to the the issues relevant for selective mutism. So, as Rachel was saying about the importance of assessment, um, we we're really in in trouble in the late '90s and early 2000s with no measures that were were um, standardized, operationalized, had no psychometrics that were specifically for selective mutism. So that was really my, um, my reason for wanting to develop a measure. So the SMQ is a parent report measure of the child's frequency of failing to speak across different settings. 
and the the development was based on um, a few different samples. The largest one was almost 600 parents that were recruited via the internet and actually through what was the precursor to the SMA, which is the Selective Mutism Group that I was involved in back then. Um, there are also samples of, of clinically assessed families and comparison families. So there are several different samples. Um, and in the end, there was, after factor analysis, uh, 17 items that assess speaking in three different domains, school situations, family and home situations, and social and public situations. So the school subscale involves speaking to most peers, selected peers, um, answering the teacher when called on, asking teachers questions, um, speaking to most teachers at school and speaking to groups or in front of the class. This um, subscale of school is also um, using just this subscale and giving to teachers is what uh, forms the SSQ, the school um, speaking questionnaire. That And there's less, I have uh, less psychometric data on the school speech questionnaire, but it's fairly widely utilized as well. The next subscale is the home and family subscale. Um, how often the child speaks at home with others present um, in unfamiliar places to extended family, on the phone to parents and siblings, to family and friends who are well known to the child and to a babysitter. And the third one is the social and public factor, which is other children, family friends who the child doesn't know, to the doctor and dentist, to store clerks and waiters, and at clubs, teams, organized activities outside of school. Um, I apologize for this, for the quality of some of these slides. They were from, they were imported. Um, so the person that is the, ha, that is spoken to the least amount are teachers at school, which is not a surprising finding to anybody who does any work with, with selective autism. Um, followed fairly closely to the doctor or dentist. Um, and then family is, of course, the least problematic. Um, this is a copy, just a copy of what the questionnaire looks like. So the, the responses are always, often, seldom, or never to each question. And then it's scored with <clears throat> never is zero. And then uh, one, two, or three for the other responses. So this is the sample comparison um, with the, um, the darkest blue is the um, clinic children who are diagnosed and then the internet SM sample. The next is the is non-clinical kids and then the next is anxious but non-SM kids. Um, and, and this is the school factor. So you can see that internet kids and the, the clinically diagnosed kids are, were pretty similar. Um, those A's and B's show who was significantly different statistically from each other. And these, <clears throat> this is the home and family factor. Um, and the SM kids talk much more at home and at family, but but significantly less than the than the anxious and non-clinical kids. Um, <clears throat> this is um, something that has enhanced the use of the selective mutism questionnaire an incredible amount. Um, Dr. Kurtz, who you'll hear, hear from, developed um, scoring templates for the SMQ that are just um, incredibly valuable. And I urge anyone who uses the SMQ to contact him for to be able to use these. Um, they allow you to have um, to enter patients. Uh, scores and compare them with other norms. Um, and they're really cool. And I don't know how he got so proficient with Excel, but I'm 
very envious. Um, so some wrap up, um, after so many years using the SMQ and working with it and helping others with it, um, I think it's incredibly helpful for the big picture and um, you know, for a snapshot, both in research and clinical settings. Um, and you know, looking at big picture progress. Um, but I think it's um, I think you can miss um, what I was calling um, the trees, you know, like the forest from the trees. Because we know, like, when you ask, like, does, let's say, does uh, the child talk to peers at school? Well, it's very complicated. Do they talk to peers when the teacher's there? Do they whisper? Do they, do they, um, do they talk to peers if there's another peer nearby? You know, there's, there's just so many different um, subtleties that can be missed. So you can't rely on this for, for a lot of, a lot of those subtleties. Also monitoring progress. I think you, there's, it's been shown in a, a treatment study I did, but lots of, it's been used in a lot of treatment studies and it's clearly sensitive to treatment changes, but I don't, it's not so sensitive that you could necessarily use it to monitor progress over, you know, a week at a time. Uh, another issue is the scoring. I designed it so that higher scores are good. Um, they mean more speech. And I know that a lot of people who have used it have reversed that because it's kind of just hard to remember. And, you know, that's fine as long as you don't try to compare it to norms that other people have developed. And a big issue is that it's not a diagnostic measure and it's so tempting to use it that way. And I mean, I know there's even a published paper I came across where they they did, they just literally you know, said selective mutism was diagnosed using the SMQ and it just isn't a diagnostic measure. Um, SM isn't diagnosed just by knowing where somebody talks and where they don't. So I, I think you know any any assessment measure can be used in a way that it wasn't meant to be used. Um, but it can, I'm so pleased that it continues to be used internationally and it's been translated into all of these languages. Um, pretty sure it's been, oh, Italian's miss missing, Italian also. Um, I'm pretty sure it's, it's, there's more languages where it's been done without my involvement. Um, there's some pub published papers where it's been, you know, normed and tested um, as well, which is just really cool. So, and I hope development continues with other people doing research with it as well. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it, which I don't often get to do. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, we have one specific question that I'm going to funnel your way now um, before we move on to the next measure. This is just about interpreting the results. So let's say you give the SMQ to someone and you find out their you know, mean school score is a 1.6 and their mean family score is a 2.7. Um, you know, how do you sort of interpret that? How might you write that up or communicate that information um, to a family? Um, that's where I think you can, you know, use the, and that's what, what, what Dr. Kurtz's, um, the template he made, you can really explain, you know, how, what the mean is of other, other, um, kids with SM, you know, whether it's above or below the mean of, of a, of a kid that doesn't have SM versus a kid that does. So if, if, if the, the kid you've assessed has a mean that's much lower than the mean of a typical kid with SM, that would suggest that it's a little more on the severe side. Does that make sense? I guess I'm asking out into the void, but um, uh, so, or if it's more near what, a, a, if, if it's, if it's a, a higher mean, other in other words, less, a more talking, less severe, then that would that would suggest that the child is is less severe. So just basically by comparing it 
to the published norms. Thank you. Sure. One of the things that I've sometimes done with the SMQ in my clinical practice um, is that after I have found the means, I've actually calculated Z-scores, which you can easily do by um, subtracting your patient, sub, no, yeah, subtracting the measures mean from your patient's mean or maybe vice versa and dividing by the standard deviation. And then it also gives you um, sort of a more standard way of seeing how far away your patient's score is um, from the, the published means. And so you can see, oh, is this a full standard deviation away? Is it a half standard deviation? Is it three standard deviations? Um, and then it, it also kind of is a, another way of kind of more quantitatively anchoring those scores. Sure, that's great. Uh, and Dr. Kurtz, thank you so much for offering to share this template, um, which I also use often and is find to be very helpful. I just want to say Lindsay set a standard, which is that we are very open source in the SM community. So she has always said, use it, use it wisely, use it well. And so I feel like I'm just paying it forward with that. So thanks for the nod. So we will have some time for questions and answers at the end as well. Um, so if there are other SMQ questions, feel free to put them into, again, the chat or the Q&A function. Um, now, though, we're going to move on to our next measure, the so social communication anxiety inventory, um, which Dr. Shibon Blum will discuss. All righty. Everybody can hear me okay? <laughs> yep. Good. All righty. There we go. Hi, everyone. I am going to talk about the Social Communication Anxiety Inventory, or shortened to the SKY. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the background to the sky, the sky and the social communication bridge and that relationship, the purpose and how to use the sky, an example of the sky and research on the sky and some other assessment measures that we use. One of the things that is important is to understand, to understand the sky, we have to understand that selective mutism is a social communication anxiety. So from my years of working in this field, which um, is over 25 years, I see mutism as a symptom. And a big part of my work is trying to understand why the factors into why somebody is mute, why it's continuing. And I learned over time, it wasn't you know, something that was figured out pretty quickly, but that there are actually stages of social communication. So the sky is used as an assessment tool for social communication anxiety treatment or SCAT. It can also be used um, in other treatments as well. SCAT, for those that aren't as familiar, is an integrative approach that utilizes CBT, behavioral and family systems for a whole person approach to treatment. The sky is based on the stages on the social communication bridge. This started back, I guess, in the early 2000s. We, some of us have been doing this, it seems like forever. Um, which is a good thing. And that when a lot of the measures um, focused on the verbal stage and what I felt was that these stages of social communication, which quite honestly, the kids kind of taught me what this was about, that they weren't just nonverbal. Some were completely shut down. Some were talking to others, but ignoring a person asking questions such as stage zero. Some were pointing, gesturing, nodding, writing. They were responsive, like stage one, one A, being um, like obviously non-verbally responsive, initiative, going up, tapping, making their needs known, but non-verbal. Some were turning to parents or peers and giving answers to them if somebody asked a question or just a natural phenomenon there. Some were just using sounds and altered sounds and through use of phonetics would start to progress into speech. 
Some were comfortable using augmentative devices. So that's stage two. And then you break that down into 2A and 2B, which is a responsive and initiative. And then of course, there's the verbal stage, right? A child's mute or not mute. And these stages are really how we can organize our thoughts to begin the treatment process. But being verbal, 3A responsive or 3B initiative, whether you're whispering, quiet, one or two words, using a kind of scripted or altered speech. And then there's elaborative, initiative, expressive, irregular volume. That verbal stage is just such a big stage. So it's really not just about speaking and not, but really truly understanding these stages. Here's a sample of the sky. We have different versions for children, for teens, adults. COVID brought out a lot more with the virtual world, so we have some adaptations there. So the purpose of this, as you can see with the sky, the different questions and the different locations, which I'll go over in a sec, is you can see the different stages and the different colors. You have got your non-communicative, the non-verbal, the transitional and verbal, and we break it down into initiative and responsive for each thing for each aspect of the social setting. So there's really two purposes. One, prior to treatment, we're going to assess an individual's highest baseline stage. Where are they when they come in for an evaluation in terms of responding and initiating? And then similar to the SMQ, we break it down into the, the mini settings within settings. So home, with peers, with family, with relatives, out and about at parties within the school environment, one-on-one -on -one with teachers and peers, small groups, large groups in the workplace for adults. And then of course, in the community, stores, restaurants, all the public settings. So we wanna really understand where they are communicating, how are they communicating? And then we begin the treatment process. We use it in our follow-up treatment to track progress, make sure things are working, and then to tweak our treatment plan. So what I did here was I just took a sampling. I took a sample of a recent um, data from a selective mutism evaluation, which is what we do when we first see a family. And part of that evaluation is the sky where we gathered a baseline or the highest stage. And you can see here in this particular case, you see the responding and initiating with the family. Everything seems okay. There's no real comments. With peers, they're using an intermediary, the parents. So when the peers come over, that's how they're starting. They're turning to their parents. So you can kind of see all along this process that we're basically able to differentiate. This helps us plan our strategies and treatment. It also helps with psychoeducation on how to train parents to bring children into communication through progressing them across or what we call bridging up or needing to bridge down in let's say louder, larger, more overwhelming settings. It helps with teacher trainings and development of school-based accommodations and interventions. And during treatment sessions, we will check the sky for progress and again, tweak that. Interesting, the whys of SM, a lot of them being, of course, timid, we know, speech and language issues, learning or processing issues, being a highly sensitive individual. There's actually patterns that we see in the sky. This is just a sample of a timid child that is speaking in some environments, but for some of our, what we call speech phobics, the ones that are really stuck in the nonverbal, you'll see pretty much nonverbal, that's what they're doing. They're not even using transitional strategies in many of these settings. So the sky can really be used to really get a picture of that child and really does lend itself to understanding some of the whys of SM, which can help us really tweak our treatment around that and helps with school-based accommodations and interventions. We've developed a lot of assessments and some of this was just the need to understand because there's just so much to a child or a teen or adult with selective mutism that is just so much more than not speaking. So the Selective Mutism Comprehensive Diagnostic Questionnaire is really what I started with. It's a 24-page document that really gathers everything and anything you can think of. And I think that's where all of the whys of SM and the stages came about because these patterns started to exist over time, you know, thousands of them over time. Now we do something called the Selective Mutism eval Evaluation or the Selective Mutism Interview, whether if they're not in a state we're licensed in through telehealth, we'll do what we call an interview. And again, we use the SKY we use the SM school evaluation form, the SM parent follow-up form, and the SKY through all of our follow-up sessions, because that way we're able to really see, as I call, the nitty gritty of what's happening with these children, these teens, and these adults to really put together a comprehensive 
step-by-step -step treatment plan. The research that was originally done is we used the SMQ when we did the study on SCAT, and that was a big part of what we did is using the validated uh, measure, the SMQ, and we used the sky in depth to really be able to see kind of the nitty gritty of what's going on to be able to tweak, to tweak the treatment. So, you know, for me, it really did just, it came about from just realizing SM was, is really not really the greatest name for this. And if you see it as a social communication anxiety where there's factors into the development and maintenance of this, and then understand those stages, you can really develop a step-by-step -step treatment plan for selective mutism. So, you know, that's pretty it in a, much in a nutshell. I mean, trying to put this into 10 or 15 minutes was my biggest challenge. <laughs> um, so really that's, you know, what the sky is about as a beginning tool to understand and then a tracking tool. And I do encourage others, um, this was like a work in progress over time, but at this point um, we tweak it, but it's pretty much done and we're using it consistently and other clinicians are using it consistently. Um, so if anybody wants to do research, you're certainly welcome to use it. it again, it's a, it actually, interestingly enough, in about 2004, 2005, I did this because I was trying to train during my conferences when I would travel and speak on SM, I was trying to train people to understand what the bridge was and the stages. So the sky came about as a way to train people originally to understand SM as a social communication anxiety. And then it just became such a mainstay and it's just used you know, in so many different areas, um, it's just been wonderful. Um, so really that's it. Anybody that wants to hear more about SM, please listen to my podcast. I really do go over a lot of SCAT and SM over the years, trying to get out so much of what's in my head. Um, we, we talk to families, we talk to individuals and so forth. So if there's any questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer any. I'm always wanting to share my knowledge on this. <laughs> Elisa, I'm going to uh, send you one question um, from the Q&A, um, I think probably pretty specific to the sky and to SCAD. Um, someone was wondering if a child can be in between stage zero and stage one. So that's an interesting question. First of all, it's not linear. You don't go from stage zero, then you master stage one, master stage two, master stage three. That's the beauty of the sky. There is, you want to know their highest stage their highest stage in a setting. So if they're in school and they have occasionally, let's say pointed or nodded, that to me is almost a stage one as a beginning treatment because you don't wanna keep them nonverbal. You don't wanna keep them non-communicative. You need to know a beginning place to begin treatment really. So if they have the ability to be verb, uh, non-verbal, that's what we're training teachers to do and giving them those strategies to help them. But we don't want to keep them nonverbal, right? Like we're not trying to master nonverbal. We're trying to bring them into verbal communication. But knowing they they are not shut down and frozen, which is a whole different, you know, situation, because then it's about comfort and engaging and really helping to minimize the sense of expectation in every way. Because if you're trying to get a child to communicate even nonverbally and they're shut down and frozen, that's that's only reinforcing their anxiety. But if they have the ability, especially over time and warm up and anxiety lowering strategies to be nonverbal, that's what we're training. We're training at least on those skills and bringing the child into transitional and verbal communication. So even for nonverbal kids, we're training to teach parents how to bring them into verbal communication by asking certain questions a certain way and using scripting a certain way and rewording things. You know what I mean? There's lots of ways to do it. But I think the key there, Rachel, from what you're telling me is knowing what their highest, what can they accomplish, even if it's not a lot. And the beauty of the comment section on the sky is that you can write that, that the child is occasionally nonverbal with his teacher, for example. So at least we know he can be. And then what I'd say is what are what is happening when he is nonverbal and what is happening when he isn't nonverbal? And then we can kind of use that as a way to, you know, bridge him more, bridge him up into communication by realizing that maybe when he's one-on-one -on -one with the teacher, he's more nonverbal, but in a larger group, when there's a lot of people around or it's loud, large, lots of people environment, he's more frozen and shut down. That gives us a lot of information. Maybe he's a sensory child. 
You know what I mean? So it's really about asking questions about that. Excellent. Thank you for explaining that. Um, is the sky open source? Can people access? Absolutely. That? It's on our website. If you go to selectedmutismcenter.org and you go to the resource page, there's lots of handouts. There's lots of information in the educational tools. It'll say like kind of like handouts and tools. The sky is right there. So you are welcome to use it there. We basically have one version. We have different versions. So if somebody wants a version on the adults or the teens, definitely reach out to me. Happy to share. Excellent. So we have a few um, questions in the chat that I'm going to save until later because I think that they're part of a, a broader discussion. So what I'm going to do next is pivot us over to Dr. Kurtz, who will be talking about a different type of assessment, the Selective Mutism Behavioral Observation Task, or SMBOT. Thank you so much. I will get started. Uh... All right, so I'm going to talk about the Selective Mutism Behavioral Observation Task, the SMBOT. So I wish I was like a really hardcore scientist and kept a little notebook with every thought I had along the way about every development, uh, and I didn't. So I'm trying to kind of recreate uh, history as I, I think it occurred. So there were some premises going into the development of this. One was this observation that SM only exists in the context of interactions. Uh, and the measures that I that were already there, like the SMQ, which uh, I, I use a lot, as uh, Lindsay knows and said, um, captures the child end of this dyadic interaction. And there seemed to be a uh, room for a measure that would under, uh, capture the interaction part of it. Uh, I was also influenced by the literature on anxiogenic parenting and the observation that anxiogenic parenting styles contribute to the onset and maintenance of SM and looking for some measure that would capture that in a rich way. And the observation that the child's variability with and without non-parents present is the sine qua non, it's the defining characteristic of the disorder. And all of us who are treating professionals, we all know the information call that we do. So my kid talks like a chatterbox at home, and then when we are with blank, he clams up completely. And so I think I wanted a measure that captured some of that variability. And as I said a minute ago, the existing tools are fantastic. They capture a child's sort of bottom line, a, a, an outcome, if you will, or a cross-section in time, rather than a process uh, that may help in the understanding of the onset and maintenance. So the original goals for this tool were to measure what interactions actually look like in parent-child dyads uh, where the child has SM attempting to capture that ubiquitous SM phenomenon of they talk like chatterboxes with us, but as soon as blank enters, they clam up. And I was also developing this as an assessment tool that aligned with the treatment paradigm that I was developing at the time, uh, which has come to be known as PCITSM, and that the heart of PCIT coding, and this is going to PCIT rather than the SM adaptation, but the heart of the coding is that it influences the coaching and that uh, the measurement in PCIT is called the DPEX. So I was looking for a parallel process, if you will, that there's something that we can assess that measures the interaction that is the uh, target of the intervention. And therefore, you would hope to see changes in uh, the assessment reflect uh, improvement in treatment. So this kind of shows that uh, in, in the true spirit of what Paul Meal uh, first offered up as a multi-trait, multi-method assessment, that each of our tools are getting at some aspect of this thing called SM, but doing it from an overlapping and different set of perspectives. So we have the SSQ and the SMQ, which are parent and teacher report, 
the sky, the FSSM that we're going to hear about uh, soon has parent and teacher input. And I put therapist rating with regard to the ATIS, although we get parent and sometimes child report. In the end, the therapist is the one who comes up with the CSR rating, the severity rating. Uh, so when you think about these different tools, it's best not to think which one should I be using, but what does each contribute to our understanding of the phenomenon? So the task, uh, the way we have designed it, is analogous to the DPIX baseline observation task in parent-child interaction therapy. And over the years, it's changed a little bit. Uh, and a nod to Jamie Furr, John Comer, and the good colleagues at uh, Florida International uh, who have tweaked it, and we've kind of co-tweaked it over the years a bit. Uh, but essentially, we have six phases. First, we have a parent and child play with the toys that we know are high-value toys for them in a playroom where we're observing from behind a one-way mirror. There are, of course, internet uh, adaptations of all this. But parent and child playing, we instruct the parent to follow the child's lead, and then we give them a bit of a semi-script where we provide some samples of different types of questions that they could ask the child while they're engaged in play. After uh, they ask a certain number of questions, we have a stranger, trained stranger, uh, safe stranger, as my postdoc likes to say, uh, enter the room, and they go through the same uh, tasks, and, and we measure that as well. We measure the interactions. Um, at the end of the stranger's time in the room, they saddle up to the parent-child dyad, and in our version of it, the stranger engages in two and a half minutes of what are called child-directed interactions, which is essentially great play therapy skills of uh, following the child's lead uh, with lots of supportive statements. And then they ask one question as kind of a taste test of how they're doing um, with warming up to that stranger. The stranger leaves. We go through the same observation with parent and child. Stranger comes back. We do the same thing. So we have essentially an A, B, A, B kind of design. And then we added a cleanup task because if kids have co-occurring comorbid disruptive behavior, you really want to know what that interaction looks like as, as well. So we added that to kind of tap into the flavor of that. And we added a separation task because many kids not most, but many kids with SM also have separation anxiety issues, if not a frank diagnosis. So it gave us a chance, gives us a chance to see what a separation may look like. Because at some point after we're uh, saddled up to the dyad, we want the parent out so we can continue doing uh, more and different exposures. And at the end of each of the times the stranger is in there, they ask one forced choice question. So the coding system that accompanies this behavioral observation task is derived from the DPIX, which is a PCIT tool, sorry for all the acronyms, uh, and it's called the SMICS-R, or the Selective Mutism Interaction Coding System, and it's been revised. It's been adapted to capture some of the nuances that are specific to SM. We broke up uh, questions into three types, yes, no, forced choice, open-ended, and we hypothesized a priori that forced choice and open-ended questions would yield higher response rates than yes-no questions. Um, we defined the opportunity for a child to respond as the adult giving them at least five seconds to answer. And we uh, added a coding category of pointing, nodding, and gesturing to capture that behavior, which is uh, often part of SM when kids are not yet ready or able to verbalize. So in this paradigm, some of the do's in child-led play include labeled praises for talking, reflecting the verbalizations or paraphrasing, and being a play-by-play -play announcer. Some of the don'ts include questions of any type when they're involved in child-led play, any prompts to talk, and of course, any negative talk about not talking, like it's rude, you know, I told you to tell Dr. Kurtz where we went this weekend, uh, and any behavior that we might label as enabling, and as all of you know who are treating professionals, the word accommodating has a different meaning in the world of education than it does in uh, the world of child anxiety. In the verbal-directed interactions where the parents are prompting for verbalizations, we have in our dues labeled praises for talking, reflecting verbalizations, being a play-by-play -play announcer, and purposely offering up forced choice and open-ended questions in a reasonable rate, 
and waiting five seconds to respond, and the same don'ts uh, apply, uh, and yes, no questions are considered uh, verboten in uh, all phases. This is a look at the coding sheet that accompanies, uh, that we use when we're actually watching the observation. So for if a parent says, hey, I'm thinking of adding some to mine, should I use blue or green? If the kid says green, then we want to see a tick mark in the verbal force choice that would be over here. If the kid points to the green, we would put a tick mark over here in the nonverbal. If the kid says, hmm, and you can't understand it, we would call that barely audible. And if the parent says right away, well, I think I'll go with green, we'd call that no opportunity. So we can tally these up. And then we're looking uh, after the stranger has been introduced, does the child answer the stranger's question? We have uh, this uh, last two conditions, the cleanup and the uh, separation at the end of the procedure. So when we uh, tabulate all of the responses across the phases, we have a nice template to help us understand interaction patterns. So one way we look at it is what was the behavior without the stranger present using the different types of questions? And what was the behavior with the stranger present? And we take into account whether there was verbalizations, pointing, nodding, gesturing, no response at all, or no opportunity. And you see some interesting patterns. And uh, this is the individual child, but uh, also a, a fairly typical profile. So we see responses to yes, no, but we also see even more no opportunities when the parent offered yes, no questions. And when the parent offered forced choice and open-ended questions, the number of no opportunity went way, way down. So it's evidence on the face of it, at least for this dyad, to encourage more forced choice and open-ended and to really discourage um, yes, no questions. And over, Looking at the data in a different way for a given subject, a given uh, client that we work with, we can see response rates with opportunity to respond. And this is the actual data from the child you just saw. So 87% of the time, the child answered when there was opportunity without the stranger, and that would reduce to 71.4% when the stranger was present. Likewise, no opportunity, which is the parent side of the equation, they uh, sort of interrupted or provide or, or cut off the child's opportunity more with the stranger present than without, 39 versus 33%. And then we can look and see uh, response patterns with and without the stranger by question type. Um, and so it provides us some useful clinical information. And when we looked at uh, groups of kids uh, collapsed across, in this case, 56 kids. We see that kids with SM, no surprise, took more uh, without the stranger present than with the stranger present. We also observed that when the stranger was present, it didn't result in more nonverbal gesturing, only less talking. We also observed, without having made predictions about it, that uh, parents would talk less and talk quieter. And again, you can see here uh, general uh, cross uh, groups of kids that the response rate with opportunity for forced choice and open-ended is nearly double that of yes, no, and that the lowest response, uh, lowest interrupting rate, if you will, was to uh, forced choice questions, which is why we've kind of defaulted to that uh, as our first choice question, not knowing anything else. And this is another way to represent some of the same data. And interestingly, when we just look at the kid's ability to answer the stranger across the first time they go in, the second time they go in, and what was the third time, we see response rates increase linearly, 26, 37%, 43%. And what I love about this, this is after two and a half minutes of these precious God-given child-directed skills. And I will stop on that note. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Steve. Um, I am going to cross my fingers that our technology works <laughs> so I can transition us to 
Dr. Gensaler's presentation. As I said, she is sleeping at home in Germany right now, where it is the middle of the night. Um, but she pre-recorded a presentation on the FSSM, or the Frankfurt Scales of Selective Mutism. Um, so we'll go through her presentation, and then we should have about 15 minutes left for questions. I know there are a few that came through the chat that we haven't responded to yet, so we will definitely get to those and any others that you all may come up with. So here we go. Hey, and welcome. It's uh, nice to be with you tonight, even if it's only by pre-recorded video. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Rachel, uh, to talk to you about the Frankfurt Scale of Selective Mutism. I hope I can give you some valuable insights about its possible use for clinical practice uh, and or research. But first of all, I want to declare that there are no potential conflicts of interest and that I did not receive uh, financial support for my research. But why did I develop a new measure? I don't want to bore you with the basics about selective mutism, its diagnostic criteria or um, its symptoms, because I think my, the previous speaker will have covered this topic sufficiently. Actually, in Germany, there was no validated scale at all on the screening, assessment, or treatment evaluation, and uh, furthermore, there are only very few trained clinicians or specialized institutions um, for the treatment of selective mutism. So clinicians are a bit lost um, if they need help, um, for example, uh, yeah, by standardized interviews or uh, questionnaires, measures, and so on. So. That was one reason, but also for research, um, I needed a measure and I wanted a measure that uh, is useful for screening and diagnostic purposes and uh, particularly differentiates between selective mutism and social anxiety disorder alone. I wanted a measure that is developmentally sensitive because as you all know, the expectations to speak um, differ considerably between children, for example, four years old or 14 year old teens. And I wanted a measure that assesses mutism severity and identifies um, individual speaking patterns so that uh, it's easier to, for example, uh, plan treatment interventions and exposition hierarchies. So it needed to cover a wide range of everyday situations of the children and teens. And uh, furthermore, I wanted the measure to be yeah, capable to, to track treatment uh, progress and uh, yeah, so one can evaluate um, the effectivity. I wanted to be at a real time saver. Uh, because if you do all this in clinical evaluation, it takes quite a lot of time. And so to sum up, I wanted the measure uh, to be helpful both for clinical practice and for research purposes. That was the idea behind the development, and that's the result. Um, actually, it's not one scale, there are two scales. Um, First, there is a diagnostic scale of uh, 10 items, which has to be answered by the parents. It's a parent rating uh, questionnaire um, with yes or no. There are questions on the general speaking behavior, like does your child fail to speak in certain situations and or with certain individuals, or questions about nonverbal behavior. Um, is your child incapable in certain situations of shaking his or her head or nodding, pointing? This diagnostic scale is followed by a severity scale. 
and there um, more than 40 items according to the age group um, they cover more specific situations as you already know it for example from the smq and uh, they are also grouped according to the location of the speaking situations for example school kindergarten or speaking in the public and at home these items have to be answered on a five point likert scale questions are for example does your child speak to his or her mother or father in the kindergarten so that others can hear him or her so it doesn't remain mute if the teacher is uh, passing or questions about speaking in public for example during group and club activities or speaking at home in the familiar setting when this measure was ready i modified and adapted it for three different age groups kindergartners school children and adolescents in germany you enter primary school usually at six sometimes at five or at seven so that's why there's a bit of a overlap of uh, ages so dependent on the setting um, the institution you choose the measure of kindergartens for example in six seven six or seven years old or um, school children measure let's have a closer look at the diagnostic scale because this is um, something uh, new uh, as you can see here there are this uh, 10 questions and these questions do not only refer to the speaking behavior but also for example um, to nonverbal communication or side phenomena like freezing symptoms uh, motor inhibition which impairs movements or mimic communications but also behaviors like active avoidance of verbal situations and or uh, negative reactions to be pressured to speak, uh, which you find quite often in children with a selective mutism. Yeah, and that's how the measure looks like. This is the measure for the, the version for the kindergartners. And uh, first, you have a short introduction for the parents, and then on the first page, um, the 10 questions um, concerning general speaking behavior, which represents the diagnostic scale. And then this is followed by the items about speaking behavior in kindergarten or school, dependent on the version, then speaking behavior in public, and then speaking behavior at home. That's it, basically. So these are the results of the evaluation study. As you can see, we included four different groups of children and adolescents. First, of course, children with selective mutism, but also a group of children with social phobia alone, children with other internalizing disorders, for example, other anxiety disorders or major depression, which uh, social withdrawal, but also a group of typically uh, developing controls. And as you can see um, on the first table, um, children with selective mutism reached um, in the parent rating out of 10, 8 to 9 um, points. So nearly every um, question was um, answered with a yes. Um, while the children with selective, uh, with, sorry, with the social phobia alone uh, scored only half of it. So this resulted in uh, practical cutoffs for um, diagnosis. Um, the optimal cutoff for the differentiation between selective mutism and social phobia is a seven for the adolescents. Um, it's uh, even only six so it's a bit lower but as you can see uh, sensitivity and specificity is not 100 um, percent 
so um, if you take this in absolute way, uh, then you miss some children with selective mutism. So for screening purposes, um, a lower cutoff, like five or six, is recommended um, to um, yeah, start with the for the clinical evaluation. And of course, there are some, not many, but some uh, cases uh, where children score seven and uh, clinically only have a social phobia. These are results of the severity scale. Um, at maximum, you can reach here theoretically uh, some score of 160, but as this uh, severity scale covers really a lot of everyday situations, this would actually um, represent like a total mutism. Um, but these children are selectively mute, so uh, on average, they reach like 90%. Uh, it's a mean sum score, um, but you see also that there's a lot, quite large um, standard deviation. So there are also quite a lot of um, children that score above 90. However, again, the group of children with social phobia alone score less than half of this uh, on average. Um, but there are no cutoffs. Uh, this is not a diagnostic scale, basically. Uh, that was not the intention behind. So there are no cutoffs or groups to be built. So you see what the FSSM is. It's a validated screening and assessment instrument for the core symptom of selective mutism, the dichotomous speaking behavior. Um, and uh, it provides diagnostic cutoffs, particularly regarding the differential diagnostic of uh, social anxiety disorder alone. And it's uh, a comprehensive and detailed assessment tool uh, for the individual speaking pattern, because you have quite a number of um, items and uh, vast information. So you can use this also for the planning of exposition um, hierarchies or exposure hierarchies. And I can assure you it's a real time saver. <laughs> Hopefully in the future, um, there will be also maybe cutoffs for severity um, and for symptom change. Um, clinically, you can already use it um, as a, to track um, treatment effectivity. What the FSM is not, it's of course not a substitute for clinical expertise and clinical diagnosis. Um, and it's also not assessing other DSM-5 uh, criteria like symptom duration, onset, uh, exclusion criteria, um, interference with daily functioning and so on. You still have to do this um, on your own. Well, can you get the FSSM? How can you use it? Um, it's an open source measure so downloads are available both on the universities of frankfurt and Gießen, and uh, there's also a manual where you find this information um, summarized i just gave you and also templates for clinical practice i will come back to this later um, the only evaluated version until now is a German version, but you will find also other authorized translations for download, um, particularly English, Norwegian, Finnish, and Hebrew. And there are some other uh, translations in preparation, um, mainly for European languages, but also Arabian, um, Japanese, Chinese, and so on. You may use this measure for um, yeah, clinical practice or also research, um, but not for commercial use and or advertisement. Uh, it's a non-commercial open source measure. Yeah, um, templates. <laughs> On the homepage of uh, Gießen, you will find uh, templates for clinical practice and for treatment uh, evaluation. Uh, this is the first um, 
page um, and let's look at it in more detail. Uh, on the left, you can enter, you can only enter the gray field, data in the gray fields. You can enter patient information and uh, the dates of evaluation and the template will calculate the rest for you. The numbers of week of treatment, the sum scores, and there are also these small boxes uh, as a reminder um, what the cutoffs um, and um, also information um, on mean values, um, the results of the evaluation study. And which I personally find very uh, helpful, you can um, consult these diagrams of the severity scale together with the families and the patients and uh, to visualize uh, treatment progress. Uh, so symptom reduction would result in lower scores in the severity scale. And it's nice to see with the patient that uh, the work they have done uh, has also shown results. For further details, you may not only consult the manual for download, but of course also the original article on the evaluation study. And since its publication, um, the FSM has been used in quite a number of uh, research studies in Germany. Um, mainly for screening and uh, diagnostic purposes, um, online surveys, but also in the um, paper pencil form. It has not yet been used for um, yeah, treatment evaluation studies, but uh, I hope this will come soon. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, as I'm not personally with you uh, tonight, don't hesitate to ask, email um, me and ask me questions about the measure, about uh, interpretation of results, possible use, and so on. Yeah, thank you much, very much again, and uh, see you maybe another time. Bye. I was muted. <laughs> that brings us to our question and answer portion of um, the talk today. I see that there are a lot of great questions that have been asked. Um, I'm going to put one out to our panelists first, and then we'll field some of these your way. Um, one of the things that struck me in listening to you all speak is that we have some great observational measures, and measures for parents to fill out, but what it feels like we're still lacking are any type of validated self-report measures um, for youth themselves to fill out, particularly for our adolescents. Um, so I'm just curious, maybe speaking more clinically, um, what, if anything, do you do to get information directly from your patients um, about their their symptoms and the distress associated with, with their SM? Yeah, like in, in our case, in, um, the kids actually create their bridges. They actually go through a sky themselves. So the teens will literally go through different teachers, how they're responding and initiating, and they'll help really navigate this with us as because they have to be an active participant. Um, we have something called the SM. It's the older child uh, follow-up forms that they'll often fill out as well, but we do get them involved in their bridges. They'll make them, they'll write it all out um, and they'll really be involved in rating and grading their feelings regarding their stages of social communication so that they can be an active participant in their treatment. Thank you, Dr. E. Did anyone else chime, chime in? I don't do anything in a systematic way across older kids in terms of asking for their self-report. 
Um, although when I take the assessment observation measure that I was describing, it's sort of a template that can be tailored to any sort of developmental uh, age or to any situation, like for people who work in schools and don't have a one-way mirror. So uh, I just think more, more flexibly about observing the interaction pattern. But to answer your question, I don't really do anything specific to solicit from older kids about that experience, about their experience. Um, my two cents, and I, I wish I could remember more exactly, but there was a researcher in Australia who um, developed a patient report version of the SMQ. The problem is I can't remember her name. <laughs> um, I think she was at McCary. Is that the way you say it? Does anyone yeah. know Steve? Steve's nodding. Okay, so if anybody was interested in tracking that down, that's a possibility. I mean, I'd be happy to track it down, but by the time it did, I did the person who wanted to use it, I wouldn't know how to find them. But so it probably wouldn't be that hard to track down a SM researcher, Gary. There also was a comment in the chat that Shelley Abney and Lauren Knickerbocker. Um, have worked on an adolescent measure um, called the SMM that apparently it's, it's still being uh, fine-tuned and isn't quite ready for broader use. So I think that that's a future direction for us as clinicians and researchers. Um, let's see, what, uh, quick question, what professionals can use these measures? Are they limited to psychologists or can they be used more broadly by people with different professional backgrounds? I think so. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, so it sounds like that if you were in a position where you have the kind of qualifications to be diagnosing um, a presentation or disorder like selective mutism, that you can go ahead and use these measures. Um, and I'm going to throw in a cautionary note. All right, go for it, Steve. That I think the more you know about psychometrics, the more you know how much you need to know about psychometrics. So, for example. Um, Lindsay provided data to suggest that there isn't a reason to use different factor scores by age within a within an already truncated age range, right? Lindsay, that's something like three to nine, mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. And yet, most people who will use the SMQ, I don't think, know that when they're using it with a twelve-year-old, that they're going beyond what the data would suggest. Now, it still may be the most face valid thing out there. And for mm -hmm. just heuristic face value reasons, that's reason enough because there isn't something else to give you the same information. Mm -hmm. uh, Angelica said that people who don't know psychometrics may not like have heard is that it's only been tested on German speaking Germans. Now I use it in our in our clinical practice now because I'm trying to see what the convergent validity is of the SMQ of this measure and there are data that they've collected on teens, but it's only been tested on German speaking Germans. So I think while anybody can use it, it's, and, and because these things are in the public domain, so like if you go through PAR or any of these uh, companies, you have to prevent, you have to provide your credentials of you know why you should have access to the test. So I would just say, cautiously ask people who know about psychometrics when you're using this, because you may be going far enough off label uh, and not be aware what the implications are. I appreciate that caveat. Yes, and that's a good point because as I was saying things like using the SMQ to diagnose, which you're not supposed to do, or like you said, it was developed for young kids. And if you're going to use it for a 12 year old or a 17 year old, even, you know, I mean, someone who's going to do that is going to quickly notice there's a question about a babysitter. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those, those are good points. So use, use with caution. And for people who do intensive training with any of us on 
this work, we do provide that guidance about what the limitations are of it. So um, I'm thrilled that about a third of the people who take my trainings are SLPs. It's just a, a treat to go beyond because they are uh, gatekeepers more than child psychologists with doctoral degrees to, to have it. So. Yeah, and you know, I've seen elementary school teachers on their own figure out what's going on with selective mutism and without the kid even being in treatment, figure out what to do and do it. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's it, it, sometimes it's the person, not the degree as well. <laughs> um, that sort of segues into a question that was asked about how um, these tools, and I think this was maybe particular to the SM bot, um, can be adapted in the school setting. Um, because of course, many school professionals, school psychologists, classroom teachers are often on the kind of front lines. Um, and not all parents are kind of receptive to the recommendation that the child receive treatment with a specialist, but the school providers may be in a position to kind of offer some support. So I, I, I take the paradigm and apply it flexibly in different settings. For example, if I was working in a school and, and, and I was the uh, key worker in the school, I could invite a parent and kid to come in, give them my office, and maybe leave the door ajar, or maybe there's a camera in there and the parents know that we're recording and we've got consent and all that. And then I can go in and saddle up to the to the play and then I can leave and I, I can do the same thing without a one-way mirror. Um, I can do the same thing when I go on intensives. I'm gonna be in Virginia this week to do an intensive. And I told the family when I get there, just be playing like his most favorite activity. And I'm gonna pretend with the other parent, like I'm just an old college friend. And then I'll kind of join their interaction and I may pop a question in, and then I may step away a little bit. So it can be applied flexibly with an understanding of what the paradigm is, even if it's not gonna yield research data, uh, you know, to have that person's information join a, a pool of the one-way mirror folks. I want to mention something too, that with um, the SM School of Alform, um, I'm happy to share that as well. It's really important when we get that information from schools, it's not always the same as what parents are telling us. So what's really nice about it is you get the parent version on the sky of how they feel their child is doing in school with peers, groups, and so forth, and teachers. But the SM School of Alform really does give you the perspective of different teachers. And that's really helpful when really knowing what's happening, you know, even that that evaluation also, um, that assessment actually goes into their academics, starting and completing tasks and things like that. So that can really help us really know kind of how they're functioning in school. And I think that information is really important because it really specifically goes to the school themselves. So that's helpful as well. But teachers use it all the time to track how the kids are doing in terms of the interventions and so forth, in terms of the sky portion of the school, the school section on the sky, and then the school of our form gives us that information from like homeroom teachers or special teachers, um, which is very helpful to get that perspective too, because sometimes they're more functioning in one setting than another. So we have just about two minutes left and I'm going to try to get in two last questions. The first one isn't really measure specific, but maybe more symptoms, um, a question about symptoms. So one of our um, audience members wrote, my client often complains of a stomach ache or body aches during social communication. Is this a symptom that's typical or an escape behavior? What are your thoughts? I mean, that's a loaded question. I think all of us are like, there's so much more to that, you know, that presentation than just, gen just that. So I guess the question is that I'd want to know is what is the expectation on that child? What is their level of functioning? Maybe the expectation is too great. They're not able to do it. So they're shutting down and getting more anxious. So that that's my first sense. Dr. Hertz, Dr. Bergman, do you want to add in or should I sneak in the last question? All right. 
um, what is the best pre post treatment measure for group uh, treatment? Any thoughts? I don't know what's best. I will tell you um, that I find it really interesting when I was reviewing the literature that the SMQ tends to produce, tends to get the same baseline outcomes and post-treatment and follow-up outcomes across intervention styles, across individual, group, and intensives, which to me suggests it's a pretty robust measure. So it's what Danielle Carnaccio used as part of her outcome measures in her dissertation. Uh, what Roz Catchpole used is uh, for her treatment. So I'm not sure what's best, but it you know it sort of depends on what it is you're actually trying to measure. I think. And for a little bit of context, Danielle Cornaccio's dissertation was a pilot study looking at an intensive um, group behavioral therapy model. Um, what sometimes you hear referred to as CAMPs, and Roz Catchpole's was an individual PCITS on the study. I mean, I think the beauty of these measures, and I think what we're all hearing and what I'm feeling is they can, like you said, uh, Steve, is they can really be adapted to different settings and the administers that, you know, the people that know how to use them can really train on them and really help others understand how do you tweak it, how do you adapt it and so forth. Because it's, I mean, these measures can be used individually and after groups because you really want to see their overall functioning, how they did in a group will then hopefully project into the school setting. So then you should be seeing changes in the school, especially with trainings. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all so much for being here on a Monday evening. Um, a huge kind of round of applause to our panelists, um, as well as to all of our audience members. Um, someone just put a last question in the chat and you send a link to that. If you send me a message, um, more specifically letting me know what link you want, we can probably get it to you. Um, we'll also kind of compile all the resources that were shared here and um, can send them out to you, to everyone who is kind of um, here and uh, registered for the webinar later this week. Um, so hopefully everyone can, can have all of these things. Um, but yeah, once again, and you know, thank you to SMA, the Macklin Foundation, and and all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a <laughs> good evening, everybody.